Hello everybody, and welcome to our very first episode of Marti's new podcast, On The Market. In this series of podcasts, we hope to get some insights into the people behind the marts and the herds we work with. Also, hopefully, a little crack along the way. In episode one, we visit the mighty Jiggenstown house ahead of their very first online sale with us here in Marti, and also to have a chat with the owner Michael O'Leary and farm manager Joe O'Mahony. Enjoy. Today I come from a uh, sunny West Mead with Michael O'Leary and Joe Manny. Uh, Michael, thanks for having us here today. And I suppose we'll start off from a young Michael O'Leary on your summer holidays in Kentork. Did you ever dream of what you have now in terms of the Angus, Angus herd? I don't think so. At first, you're very welcome to Jigginstown in the week of the Jigginstown Angus sale. No, I mean, you know, I spent my summers when I was a youngster in uh, my family had a farm in, in Banna outside uh, Cantork. It was a dairy farm. Um, so it was great fun spending time there bringing in hay, uh, milking cows, uh, all the hard end of it. Uh, but no, at that stage, I think I wanted to play professional football for Man City. Um, for many years, I probably could have. They were so awful, but I wouldn't get near them now. <laughs> Um, I never thought I'd finish up in farming, but um, it was always something I was fond of the land, and I always wanted to replicate that for my children, uh, that they would grow up on a farm surrounded by horses, cattle, animals, because I think it's a great way for children, it's a great uh, place for children to grow up. You've had great success with the horses to date, but I suppose from the Martyr's perspective, we want to concentrate on the Angus breed. What drew you to them, and can you tell me about the origins of the herd? Well, we started back about 90 and then uh, some about 25 years ago. You know, at the time, it was very fashionable in Ireland to have Charlets and Blonde Aquitaine's big plow pullers. You know, I was never particularly interested in those um, uh, at all, was one, but I did want to develop a pedigree herd. You know, like most people who got into farming, I was buying my cattle in March, April uh, at high prices, selling them in September, October at low prices and losing money in between. It seemed the only way to kind of exit that cycle was to you know, build your own facilities and develop our own herd. We looked around, we studied the Herefords, uh, the Angus, the indigenous breeds. Um, and I think I always preferred the Angus cattle because uh, once you've tried black, you'll never go back. And I suppose, Michael, from seeing you in media, you are a very busy man. How much time do you get to spend on the farm? Not as much as I'd like. Uh, you know, in essence, Joe uh, has uh, runs the farm with a very good team of people here. Um, you know, my contribution is largely confined to weekends and occasional evenings during the week when there's a crisis or there's something needs to be done. But I work closely with Joe and the team. Uh, I think my input is more on developing the facilities and paying for them. Um, Joe and the, uh, the guys here do a fantastic job to have developing the herd. It started 25 years ago when we first imported just, I think it was 20 cattle, 20 um, heifers and a bull from Canada. And it's grown today now to about 600 head. The pedigree herd is about 400. And there's a commercial Angus uh, herd here, about 200 head. Just jumping on your what you were saying there about the facilities, the new shed outside for the bulls, I presume not many people would have seen it yet, but the facilities I was very impressed with, and I'm sure listeners at home, the peat bedding, the crush, the comfort of the cattle was something I was very impressed with. When you started designing that, why did you choose that way? Well, I think, you know, we've built a number of sheds over the years. We started off like everybody else, making all the same mistakes. You know, we built a large shed with concrete walls. It was all enclosed, designed to keep cattle warm and comfortable during the winter. And what we discovered was, you know, repeated problems with controlling the temperatures with pneumonia and everything else. So, um, when we first went to Canada 25 years ago, you know, we saw cattle in the middle of winter who were living in minus 50 degrees of wind chill and spent all their time out, outdoors. So what we've evolved into, I think, now is sheds, you know, that, we're, uh, that we have no walls, uh, where eff- effectively we try to replicate uh, outdoor conditions in the sheds. I mean, big roofs, so we keep the rain uh, off them. Um, but they seem to be happier in larger sheds uh, where there's plenty of air, uh, they don't get kind of, you don't have these uh, rises in temperatures uh, and there's plenty of room for them. Uh, Joe and I disagree on peat bedding. Joe's a great lover of peat bedding. I hate the stuff. I want to go back to straw. 
thankfully, uh, one of the few thing, good things the Greens are going to do is be to ban peat harvesting. Uh, so I think shortly we'll be going back to straw bedding here, which is the way, way I believe the cattle should be. Uh, to be fair, the cattle love the peat bedding, but I find it very dirty. The sheds get very dirty uh, and dusty. Uh, I know they do on straw as well, but I would prefer to have them on. I think straw ultimately is cleaner, although we disagree about it. And where we disagree, we do what Joe decides. Yeah, well, straw will get the year, this year as well with the new incentives coming into chop straw. But uh, jumping on back to what you said about your commercial herd as well, have you any, I suppose, ideas on expanding the herd even further? I think so. You know, like I think we'll ex probably expand. I don't think we want to expand the, the, the pedigree herd beyond, you know, we've kind of 200 cows. That's enough. Uh, but that's it's in essence, that gives us about 400 head of pedigree cattle every year. It means we keep the quality high. We invest repeatedly in the best of bulls and the best uh, female genetics. On the commercial side, we want to support the things like the certified Angus beef program. Uh, we, given the size of herd we have, we will always have culls, or, you know, bulls that are not up to standard here. We cull those and put them into the commercial herd. And so we're able to kind of service or sell into the factories uh, on an ongoing basis through the uh, Certified Angus Beef Programme. And I think there's a nice balance there of having, you know, the guts of about 400 pedigree cattle and about 200, 250 commercial cattle. I think in the next number of years, Obviously, I'm you know reducing significantly the uh, the jumps, the number of jumps horse I have here. So we're not bringing home as many jumps horses during the summer. So I think the commercial uh, Angus herd will probably grow slightly, but it has to be manageable, you know. And like we've uh, Joan has, and the team here, we're a very good team of people, but we don't want to flood the place with cattle either. You were just saying there about buying in stock. What are you looking for? in bulls from other herds around Ireland? What is your main qualities? I mean, you know, we are tend to, for what we're looking for is the best genetics. You know, we try not to breed very big bulls here. You know, what we're, we're conscious of the market here, you know, is pedigree breeders, but also dairy uh, farmers who want ease of calving. You know, so we want well-built uh, bulls, but not huge kind of, you know, we're not looking for the biggest bulls. And clearly we want, we're trying to develop bulls and heifers here who feature well in the STARS program. Uh, we've been very fortunate, I think, in that in recent years. So as the STARS program has evolved, you know, we have lots of four and five star bulls and heifers. And I think what we're trying to do is to provide a high quality pedigree animal that the market wants, both pedigree breeders, but it also services the needs of dairy farmers who want easy calving uh, who are easy, easy calving bulls and I think we deliver that we have a reputation uh, well established over the last 10 or 15 years for you know uh, t selling very good bulls backing them up if there's a problem with the bulls we'll take the bull you know we take the bull back we'll give you another one um, and we stand behind our stock and I'll jump to Joe and in in I'll come back to Joe in a moment there about the, the to bulls talk about Pete. to talk about Pete to talk about the bulls that we have for the private sales outside mm. but Chicken Sound, it's famous for its on-farm sale. Why yeah. did you decide to go down that route all them years ago? I think when we started, you know, we, uh, A, I mean, the first year or two, we didn't have big numbers. Uh, it was easy to do one or two far off sales. I think we wanted the on-farm sale and we promoted it heavily to, you know, to kind of build up the, the, the name and reputation of the herd. We also wanted to open it up to invite as many pedigree breeders, dairy farmers to come and, you know, see the stock and make a kind of a day out of it. You know, we generally grab the Saturday before Easter, which was kind of a good day for, uh, it's a day when most people have the day off. And we tried to make a, you know, a, a mini event out of it. Um, and then, you know, I think what's happened in recent years is we have enough volume, you know, this, uh, we're, we're planning this uh, next Saturday, if COVID had permitted, you know, we'd be selling 30 or 40 bulls and up to 20 heifers. It's big enough now that we can run it through one day. And I think, you know, it also helps the guys here. Like this is a busy time of the year. You know, we farm over what twelve hundred acres of land here. There's tillage. Uh, we have animals. We have horses. Kind of uh, ped or uh, horses being covered in foal and being covered. So you know, we don't want a lot of time wasted uh, meeting individual people coming to see a bull. Not see so. It's a very useful way of you know establishing the name getting the name out there, encouraging other people to get involved in the pedigree Angus breeding. You know, there's lots of peasants out there who are breeding Herefords and some other, you know, dreadful old breeds. <laughs> and we want to convert them to the one true path of uh, pedigree Angus breeding. 
we want to promote the breed, uh, get rid of all those old French plough pullers. Um, and I think the, uh, the Angus sale here in Jingstown helps us to do that. I suppose I've been speaking to Joe about the online sale, which is going to be a first here. Mm. What's your, what was your initial thinking on it? I think I'm very excited by it. Like, you know, it's the way of the future here. Um, it's been one of the ways, you know, farming has been able to, Marts have been able to maintain their business during the COVID-19 pandemic. You, you look at so much, many aspects of our lives are moving online. Now, you know, I think on uh, online sales will never replace the kind of social aspect of going to a mart. But increasingly, it does widen the base of buyers who can be, you know, encouraged or incentivized to look at a farmer stock when he's selling them. Uh, and I think going forward post-COVID, there's going to be, the marts will be using, you know, the online platforms like Marti uh, to broaden the base and I think to help demand for cattle and for stock through the marts. It's the way forward. I suppose just before we head over to Joe, uh, I have two last kind of opinion questions for you. Farming mm. in 2021 and the unprofitable nature of the suckler farmer, how... Does a suckler farmer become profitable apart from buying an Angus? I, mean, I think it's going to it's, it is going to be very challenging into the future for the suckler farmer to be profitable unless you know he gets significantly bigger. There is no doubt, you know, in all aspects of economic life and particularly in farming, scale is what matters. You know, the dairy farmers will become bigger, uh, pedigree breeders will need to become bigger, uh, and the suckler men will have to get bigger. But, you know, you look at the inputs and the cost of land, it's going to be very difficult for the traditional farmer who may have had 20 or 50 acres buying cattle in March and April and selling them in September, October. You know, that's not going to be the way forward. Um, And I don't think there's much of a future for that small scale, unless obviously, uh, you know, he has or he or she has an off-farm income. Is it down to genetics? Can Can you see a model for suckler farmers been down to pure genetics, like what we have in James Alexander in the North? I think it's difficult. I mean, I don't think so. You know, there will, uh, but I think the successful suckler farmers in future will get bigger by, in scale. You know, I think you'll be moving towards feedlots, that level of scale. Uh, and then you'll have, you know, the hobby farmers um, who have off-farm income or who do it you know, for, as a hobby and as a passion. They'll always be there. But it'll be very difficult, I think, for farming to, you know, mid-sized farms to survive on suckler, on suckler programs alone. And I suppose just the last thing before we head over to Joe, we see today that the rural independent TV is saying that the new climate action bill will kill the economy and it will require a 51% cull of the national herd. What's your opinion on this climate action bill? I mean, you know, I think the climate action bill is well-meaning, but, you know, uh, or fundamentally misdirected. Uh, but, you know, it's very politically popular you know, to jump on sort of bandwagons. You know, fundamentally what we need to produce first is food. Um, I don't see any prospect of the national herd being reduced by 50%. I don't think it'll be reduced by 40% or 20% either. Um but an awful lot of those climate action people, you know, if you were really serious about reducing carbon in the economy, you'd be promoting nuclear power. And yet, you know, they're no interest in promoting nuclear power either. So an awful lot of it is well-meaning, but uh, badly thought out. Uh, we do need to, to develop more sustainable uh, method, mechanisms for farming. Um, but I don't have any truck with people who suggest that somehow we'd reduce the national herd by 50%. Uh, it will lead to significant rice uh, increases in food prices, and if significant increases in food prices are simply not acceptable uh, politically or economically. You know, we have uh, had major success in this country, I think, in the last 20 or 30 years, reducing the cost of food, and the consumer has been, uh, the, gain, uh, has been the beneficiary of that, and that will continue. Perfect. Thank you very much, Michael. And I suppose, look, we'll head over to Joe. Joe, I met you for the first time last week. Um, I was seriously impressed by the facilities. I was seriously impressed by your passion for this level of stock. Um, Going back to the outwintering regime that you talked so fondly on, I was fascinated on your vision for it. Where and what does it hold for you? Uh, It gives a chance for the bulls to grow and uh, not push them on. Uh, too quickly it keeps the hair on them and that's what the shed was been michael uh, spoke about the shed there saying that uh, there's plenty of air in it and that was one of the principles behind the shed that we continue 
with those bulls growing the hair so that they're winter hardy and that you can sell them on to farmers without uh, losing condition. And part of that was the outwintering. And, uh, you know, you can give them a chance to grow without over pushing them. Once they come in, you can push on the feed and the weight gains uh, will follow. And I suppose then jumping on to the bulls you have outside in this marvellous shed, um, the majority are sold, but yes, some serious bulls on offer. What qualities do they hold in comparison to other Angus breeds or ang- other Angus herds around the country? I'd say the main difference is we give the bulls a chance to grow. Uh, most of the bulls are 16 to 20 months. And for the larger dairy farmer, he sees a well-grown bull and he knows they'll be able for big numbers. Um, our bulls are naturally grown. They have a chance to put on the weight when they have the frame. And we're not trying to push a 12, 15 month old bull. We're selling bulls at 16 to 20 months. So we can give those bulls a chance to grow and they'll perform better. And I suppose with your vision for the herd, what lies ahead into the coming years? Yeah, we'll have to keep an eye on genetics. We'll have to keep an eye on bloodlines. But more importantly, we have to keep an eye on the market. The market dictates to us what type of bulls we buy. With the increase in dairy, um, Obviously, you'll have to keep an eye on the calving ease. We've always had bulls that would suit both. We have um, a good trade with the suckler farmer, but equally, we have a good trade with the dairy farmer. Traditionally, the dairy farmer up around here liked a good calf, and this year, especially with the high prices for the calves, that's reflected in the number of dairy farmers that have moved early and bought the bulls. Um, with even more of an increase to dairy, we'll probably have to go for... Um, a, a bull that will suit that market, an easy calving bull for heifers, but we have both and we have we run eight or nine stock bulls. So we'll always buy a good selection, uh, keep an eye on the terminal figures. We have a very good terminal figure in Chickenstown. It's probably one of the highest in the country, but we'll marry that with the calving needs and that's where we hope to go. Perfect. Well, look, I'd like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to do this. Um, I suppose for everyone at home, the sale is on this Saturday, the 24th at 3 p.m. And... We're all looking forward to it here in Martai, and I'm sure Michael and Joe will be quite happy on Saturday evening after it. We hope so, and we'd like to thank the team in Martai, you know, for working so closely with us here to get the sale online on Saturday at reasonably short notice. We're excited uh, that the heifer sale is going online only. Uh, the, the stock are on view for the up until about lunchtime on Saturday, and it's an exciting development in Jigginstown, and we're delighted to be working or doing this uh, revolutionary online sale with Marta. Thank you very much, gentlemen, and God bless.